In Mark, the 16th chapter, beginning with the 9th verse, I wish to read such a glorious text. It's about the resurrection. Now, when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalena, out of whom he had cast seven devils. And she went and told them that had been with him as they mourned and wept. And they, when they heard that he was alive and had seen, been seen of her, believed not. After that, he appeared on other form unto two of them as they walked and went unto the country. And they went and told it to the residue, neither believed they them. After he appeared unto the leaven as they sat at meat and abraded them with their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay their hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So then, after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth preaching everywhere, the Lord working with them, confirming the word with signs following. Amen. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we say now, as we approach the Father's throne, and in your name we believe this to be your word. We believe this to be the last words that come from your lips before you send it up. And we ask that you will bless them to our hearts this afternoon for the sake of those that are sick. We thank you for calling that great number to your throne last night. We've seen those great Lines of those people, men, women, fathers, children, mothers, coming down the row and moving into that prayer room. We thank you for that, Father. And now we pray that you'll give to them the riches of your kingdom. May there be faith among us this afternoon to make the word of God to be a reality to us. And you're the only one who can do this, Father, so we ask it in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Let me be seated. Now, my text this afternoon, I want to take it, and it sounds a little strange. And I want to take it because of yesterday at the breakfast, I met one of the finest type of man. And he's sitting behind me now, an attorney. And we were talking about the trial. And it more or less was a mock trial or something that was given our Lord. And I, I certainly believe that that man would be a better man to stand here and typify it and for the courts of the land because I spoke of him since I have met him. And he, they tell me he's a wonderful attorney. So I know that he would give him a fair trial. And being that Jesus never got the right kind of a trial, and he is the word. We all agree upon that. He is the word. So I have read his word, and we're going to put the word on trial this afternoon. The word is on trial. The case is the word of God's promises versus the world. And the cause for the indictment is a breach of promise. And the, I think the prosecuting attorney always represents state. I think that's right. And the, Satan is the prosecuting attorney. He represents the world in this trial. And the defendant is God. And the defense witness is the Holy Ghost. So 
I want to make the, the church, the congregation, both jury and judge. And let's hear the trial now as we raise the curtains on the scene and see where we're setting. Now, don't forget now that the, the, what we're saying here is the cause for this trial is the word of God versus the world. The cause for the indictment is a breach of promise. That is, that the world claims that God made a promise that's not true. That's a breach of promise. He don't keep his promise. And the prosecuting attorney in this case is Satan that represents the world. And the defendant is God himself. And the defense witness is the Holy Ghost. And now we call the court to order. And now the prosecuting attorney is going to call his first witness to the stand and swear him in. And now he has three witnesses this afternoon I want to use, he wants to use rather, in this trial. And these witnesses are Mr. Unbeliever. The next is Mr. Skeptic. And the next one will be called, will be Mr. Impatience. Now, uh, these are the witnesses against the case that God doesn't keep his word. His word isn't true. And we can see before we start the trial that, that so many of the world tries to say that God's word is not true. For instance, this I just read. Uh, I was reading the footnotes on Schofield. And uh, I was thinking of a story that was told me one time. I think, don't think I have ever quoted it, especially in this meeting, but that uh, a woman one time had a fine young boy, he wanted to be a minister, so she was kind of a poor sort of a woman, and she wanted her boy to get all the good schooling and training he could, which any mother would want her boy if he's called to such as that, would be the very best training that could be gotten while she wanted him to have it. So she sent him away to the very best uh, religious uh, seminary that she knew where to send him. Well, he had been there about a year, and one day his mother took Violet sick. She was real bad off, and, and they kept uh, calling and sending telegrams. She's living by herself, and, and he might have to be called home because she took a real serious cold and had run into double pneumonia and had congestion in the lungs. And she looked for to die. Her heart was showing up too bad. So the faithful physician was doing all that he knew how to do to save the woman's life. And she constantly got worse. So the, the physician sent a telegram to the young fellow and said, Stand by at once to get your airplane reservations for you may have to come to your mother at any time because she looks like she's pretty close to the point of death. And then the boy, all upset, uh, got his clothes ready and was fixed to catch a plane, and, and a telegram comes straight back from his mother. Don't come, son. I, I got all right. So then, about a year later, or six months later, I believe it was, that he returned to his home. And after greeting his mother, and they was having fellowship together, he said, Mother, there's one question that still lingers in my mind. He said, when you were so sick... And said, you never did write and tell me the details. You just said you got well. And you never did tell me the details of how this come about. She said, son, you know, down the street here, right where that old grocery store used to stay on a certain place. Yes. There's a bunch of people down there that worships in that little uh, building. Yes. That I remember them. They're the Pentecostals. I said, yes, that's right. I said, uh. When I was at my very worst, said there was a fine lady come up here to me, and she said, Sister, we were down there in prayer meeting, and we understood that you were very sick, and you had a boy away in, in a seminary school and to be a minister. And while we were praying, the Lord revealed to us that we should come pray for you. And said, uh, Oh, well, she said, uh, that, That'll be fine. Said, Do you mind if a pastor comes and prays? Said, why, certainly not, lady. I'd be glad. Said, uh, uh, so they brought the, the doctor said that would be fine. So the, the pastor come up and he 
you read this scripture here, Mark 16th chapter, and he said, this is what the Bible said. So he laid his hands upon the woman and prayed, went out and said, she got well. She said, oh, he said, mother, she said, isn't that wonderful, son? Think of that. Oh, he said, mother, of course, that had nothing to do with your getting well. He says, perhaps some of the medicine that the physician had given you before, it just didn't take effect at time. And said, uh, oh, she said, no, son. The physician had quit giving me medicine two days. Said there was nothing he could do. He just put me under oxygen. And said uh, there was nothing he could do, and I was constantly getting worse. Oh, he said, mother, it, it wasn't that. Said, you see, those are illiterate people. Said, they really don't understand. They just read the Bible and said, you see? She said, well, aren't we supposed to believe the Bible, son? Oh, sure, said mother. We're supposed to believe it. But said, you know, in the school, said, we learned that verse he read there from Mark 16 from the ninth verse on. It's not even inspired. Well, she said, glory to God. He said, mother, you're acting like them people. And said, why, the very idea. She said, well, honey, I was just thinking said, what you thinking? said, if God could heal me with that part of the word is not inspired, what would he do with that really is inspired? So, that's, so we believe it is inspired. So now, this we are going to let the prosecutor call his witnesses. The first one to the stand to witness against. I just said that a few minutes ago because I was just reading, when I was reading this text, Mr. Schofield says that some of the manuscripts don't pack that. That's probably where that story come from. But it is so. So Mr. Unbelief comes to the stand and takes his stand now to testify against the word of God, the witness against it. And now when he, uh, he is to be the first witness to stand by. Now we find out that after he's sworn in, now his complaint is this. That the word of God's promises are not altogether true. Now, all these witnesses that the prosecutor's bringing up claims to be believers. They all claim to be believers or they give the evidence of this. We would have never attended such meetings if we wasn't believers. So they, they say that they are believers. And the complaint that Mr. Unbeliever gives against the word of God... He claims that Mark 16 isn't true. It just can't be true. For he said that he had been sick for some time. And he's given his testimony now that he was sick for some time. And he went to a so-called Holy Ghost meeting where people were laying hands upon the sick and they claimed that they were being healed. So he went into this prayer line. And when he did... He had been very sick for some time, and he was prayed for by this Holy Ghost, so-called Holy Ghost bunch of people that were shouting and making noises and claiming that they were healed. And Mr. Unbeliever walked through this line, had hands laid up on him, and that was over two months ago. And there hasn't been one sign of recovery. So he says that the Word of God is... That part is not true. Now, so uh, the prosecutor takes down his first witness. He brings up his next witness to the stand. And the next witness comes up is Mr. Skeptic. He's sworn in. He takes a stand. Now he claims that he is a believer. And he heard in the city that uh, they had a church where they had a faithful pastor, so-called godly man. So the congregation said, and this man believed the scripture, so he said, and he prayed for the sick and anointed them with oil. And he read the chapter of this in the Bible, James, the fifth chapter, the 14th verse, any among you sick, let them call for the elders of the church and let them anoint them with oil, pray over them. The prayer of faith shall save the sick and God shall raise them up. So. He said that he goes in being a sick man, been turned down of ever being able to get over this undulant fever that he had. And the doctor said that he could not get over it. There's no way for him to. So he taken God at his word and he found this so-called godly pastor that all the congregation had all kinds of testimonies that they had been healed. 
and so forth. And this godly pastor prayed over him, anointing him with oil according to the word of God. He did not doubt the man's sincerity. He did not doubt the sincerity of the congregation. But the pastor carried out the order just as the Bible said, anointed him and prayed for him. And that was better than six months ago, and he hasn't showed one sign of recovery. So he gives that testimony. Now, the second witness steps down. The prosecutor then brings up his next witness, which is Mr. Impatient. He brings up, and he's sworn in to give testimony against the Word of God, not being true. This man comes forth, and he claims that he is a believer, and he was reading one day in Mark, the 16th chapter, uh, or the 11th chapter of Mark, rather, and beginning with the 22nd verse, where Jesus himself, he claims that he had a red letter Bible. And the red letters was the exact words that Jesus said himself. And that in this red letter Bible, in Mark, the 11th chapter, where Jesus is speaking, he made this quotation, have faith in God. For verily, verily, I say unto you, if you say unto this mountain, be ye cast into the sea, and don't doubt, but believe that what you have said shall come to pass, you can have what you said. And he had been a cripple, he says, here for, for many years, since he was a boy. He'd been lame in his feet. He had to walk with crutches. So he accepted that as being the infallible word of God. And he said within his heart, as he claims to testify now, he said, I will walk. And he accepted the word of Jesus Christ. He said that he would walk because Jesus said so. If you'll say to this mountain, be moved. And when you, stand, when you pray, believe that you receive what you ask for and you shall have it. And he asked for it. Prayed for it, said he would have it, and that's five years ago. And he's still lame in his feet. He hasn't gotten any better. Now, the prosecutor comes forth after his witnesses as give three different quotations of the scripture, which is a, and the Jewish court is a witness, gives three witnesses of scripture that was wrote in God's Bible supposedly that Jesus Christ said it, which is the Son of God, God made flesh dwelling in a man, infallibility, and the prosecutor comes forth now to nail down the case to you people. Now, you remember, you are the jury. You are the judge. So the prosecutor wants you to know now as he nails down the case, again, these people claim that they are believers, just as the rest of them claim. So he claims also, the prosecutor wants you to know that God is not justified in putting such rational promises in his word when he does not back it up. For he has given this to his believing children to claim. And by them claiming it, they are brought to shame and are disgraced by claiming the words which are not true. The prosecutor now. For he has failed to make the promises of three, three witnesses which has been carried out exactly according to the word of God. And he wants, the prosecutor wants you to know that God has failed in all three cases to make any manifestation of keeping his word. He's nailing it down for you. And to these claim believers. Then again, the prosecutor wants to turn, call your attention to something else. He, that is God, promised that all things were possible to them that believed. He promised that. The prosecutor wants you to know that. And these so-called believers has tried to keep this word and he failed to keep it. Therefore, he sued for breach of promise. Yet again, the prosecutor wants to call your attention to another word of God. He claims to be alive after his death. Jesus claims to be alive after his death. 
And the prosecutor wants you to know that he has seen no man with nail prints in his hands and scars uh, all over his body from the lashes and prints of the spikes in his feet. Neither has he seen any crown of thorns up on any man's head. And yet he claims to be alive after his death. Also, he claims that in Hebrews 13, 8, that he lives and it is not so. He claims also in the chapter of Luke, the 17th chapter and the 30th verse, that in these days that we live in now, that he would reveal himself as he was then, so would he be. He claims also, the prosecutor now, giving you the nail down case, that in Revelations 10, that the seventh angel, when he begins to sound, that's the, the angel to the Lady Osea church, that's supposed to call the church back to the faith of the fathers. That when this angel sounds, that um, the, all the mysteries of God should be revealed in that day. He also claims that in Malachi 4, that the holy prophets prophesied that there would be a prophet rise in that day to make these claims true. And there's none of it so. He also claims that heavens and earth will fail, but his word shall never pass away. Now the prosecutor's got a case here. He's nailing it right down. Now, he gives it over to you, audience. To you who are both judge and jury. Now, we've heard his side. We've heard the witnesses. We hear what they say about it. We hear what the prosecutor pours in the word and nails it down from both sides. All the promises that God makes, and there isn't any of it that he can see that's the truth. So he's trying to get an indictment against God and against him making such rational promises because the promises that God has made is absolutely rational. The promises that he made for this day is absolutely rational. And he doesn't keep them. Now we've heard his sign. So now let us um, call the prosecutor's witnesses to step down and the prosecutor... And now we will call the defense witness to the defendant. And the defense witness now is the Holy Spirit. Now he comes and takes a stand for the defendant. Now the first thing he wants to call to the attention of this court. Hallelujah. That the prosecutor is misinterpreting the word to the people just like he did to Eve at the beginning. Remember... He was her interpreter. God told what they should do. There never be death, sorrow, or nothing. And he come around and misinterpreted the word. Therefore, when man got from behind the word of God, what does it make then? He is not defended by God. But you see, Satan was the interpreter of the word to Eve. She wouldn't listen to her husband and to God. But she took the prosecutor's interpretation of the word. And he has no right to give any interpretation. And neither does any man have a right. God's his own interpreter. He doesn't need us. He keeps his word, we believe. Now, he wants to call your attention to that. That the same interpreter to the first words of God that was spoken is the prosecutor who's trying to, to bring indictment before this court this afternoon of the same one. And he's misinterpreted the word. That's the first thing the defense witness wants to say. Now, he wanted to bring this to your attention. That he was Eve's interpreter. And he misinterpreted the word. First place, he wants to give you this idea, that the promise is only to believers, not make-believers, skeptics, or unbelievers. It's only for those that believe. I want this court, the defense witness, the Holy Spirit wants this court to realize that these promises are only for believers. Then in a cross-question... He said, these are believers. And now 
the defense witness himself should know whether they are believers or not because he is the one that quickens the promise. I ain't going to get past that. We've got a right hot trial going on. How are you going to get a past that? The Holy Spirit should know for he is the life that's in the Word. He's the one that quickens the Word. Just like your spirit quickens your body. And the body is quickened by the Spirit. Without the Spirit, the body is of no effect. The body's dead and the Word is dead without the Spirit. It takes the Spirit to bring forth the Word. To make it live. And He is the quickener of that Word. And He is the defense witness of the defendant. Amen. How are you going to get a pass then? I want this court to understand that very well. That He is the quickener. He should know. He quickens the Word. Again, He wants to call the attention of this court to the Word of promise that's in question. He never set any certain time for Him to recover. He said, The prayer of faith shall save the sick, and God shall raise them up. He didn't say right then. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. He never said a day, month, year. He just said they shall. The defense witness wants you to know that, that he didn't say there'd be a miracle performed. He just said they shall recover. Interpret the word right. They shall recover. He never said any certain time. And that is if they are believers. If they are believers, it shall recover. They'll lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Whether it's now, week, month, year, 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, they will recover. He said so. That is, if they can't hold on to their believing. Now, that's the defense witness. Another thing the defense witness wants to call to this court's attention this afternoon. That also, the word is a seed. And the seed has to fall in fertile soil in order to quicken it. The seed will not grow on a rock. The seed has to have fertility. And the word has to fall in faith, which is the fertility that brings the word to pass. Now, the defense witness at this time, we could call, lots more things could be said, but we don't want to keep you too long. We've got a big prayer line. I want you, court, to listen. The defense witness now will call his witness. See, the defense witness has a right to call a witness because the prosecutor turned, called a witness. Now, the defense witness is going to call a witness. And the defense witness wished to present to this court this afternoon the prophet Noah. Come forward, Noah, and take the stand. Now, I understand that you have a testimony concerning a word of God that was given to you. Yes. The witness today wants to say to this court that he was just an ordinary man, and he believed God, and he lived in a scientific age where they believed that the days of miracles never was. There never been rain upon the earth. But one day, he met God, and God told him to prepare an ark for the saving of the people. And all would come in this ark would be saved. And the witness wants to say that he solemnly, with all his heart, believed it. And he went to preaching it. And he went not only preach it, but to make his, his works testify of his faith. He started building the ark. And the witness wants to point a finger to Mr. Unbeliever and to Mr. Skeptic and Mr. Impatient. They haunted me day and night. When is that rain going to fall? Ah, you said that a year ago. And there's no rain up there. We went to the scientists and they proved there's no rain up there. And they claimed that I was crazy. And they scoffed at me. And told me that I was altogether foolish and simple to believe such a rational promise as that against scientific research. 
But he said, I worked on on the program because I held steady because I know it was God's word and it can't fail. I built the ark. And after the ark was completed, then the scoffers run around and around the ark daily as I stood in the door preaching to them. And they still said, now that's been 120 years ago. Now where's your ring? So you see, your labor's all in vain, they said. Our scientists are right. And there is no such a thing, and you're altogether a simple old man for believing in such a rational promise as that. And then the day come when I started to walk out one morning out of my ark, and all of a sudden, without a hand on it, the door closed right in my face, and I was sealed on the inside. Now what's happened? Then I climbed the ladders that I had built and got up in the top and pulled back the window. And I could hear them on the outside. Mr. Unbeliever sitting over there. Mr. Uh, Skeptic. Mr. Impatient. Saying, now what happened? He trapped his own self. And I thought surely the rain would fall then. And the day that I went in was on the 27th or the 17th day of May. The door shut in my face. I called my people together and said, get ready. The rain will be falling in the next few minutes. And all day long, Mr. Unbeliever and Mr. Skeptic, Mr. Uh, Impatient, walked around and around my ark criticizing me. Saying all kinds of evil about me. But I told my congregation... Be quiet. God made the promise. Amen. The second day, the sun come up bright. No rain, no thunder, no lightning. The third day, the same, the fourth, fifth, sixth. But on the morning of the 24th day of May, 120 years later, there come a gusher coming down from heaven. And all the anointed by Mr. Skeptic, Unbeliever, and Mr. Patient perished on the outside. The fifth witness said, step down, Noah. I want to call another witness. Come up, Mr. Abraham. I want you to give testimony. Mr. Abraham comes up and said, I was working on my farm just outside of Europe, the land of the Chaldean. And I had married my half-sister. Her name is Sarah. And my name is Abram. And I met God. And God told me that I was going to have a baby by Sarah. And Sarah at this time was 65 years old. And I was 75 years old. And God told me that I would have a baby through Sarah, and through that child, the whole world would be blessed. And I would be the father of nations. Quickly I returned. For this joy that was in my heart, I'd always loved children and thought I never would have any. But when God said I was going to have it, I believed it. I went to a doctor to make the arrangements. He run me out of the office. Mr. Unbeliever was sitting there. (laughs) And I went out into the street, and the authorities wanted to arrest me up for a mental case. And then, as the years went by, Mr. Impatient tormented me day and night. The first month, I said to my wife, Sarah, see, she was way past menopause. It ceased to be with her as it is with women. And I said to Sarah, Honey, we got all the little booties and all the bird eye and the, the, the pins. We're all ready, are we? Yeah, all ready. It's going to happen now. You watch. And at the end of the 28 days, I said, How you feel, honey? There's no difference, Abraham. 
Well, he said, I said, bless God, Sarah, don't you doubt it. God said so, we're going to have it anyhow. This went on through the years. And after, year after year of passing, Mr. Skeptic, Mr. Unbeliever, and all of them made fun of me. But in 25 years later, the baby was born when I was 100 years old. God didn't tell me to have the baby the next day. He said I would have it. I don't care how long it took. God promised it. I waited 25 years. They thought I was going to get so old I'd I'd die. But I said, I can't die. The promise is to me. God said so. How Mr. Scoffer, Mr. Unbeliever, Mr. Skeptic, Mr. Impatient constantly come by. I had man anointed and said, Abraham, how many children now, father of nations, do you have? But I held steady because I never staggered at the word of God by unbelief. I know God was able to keep every word he promised. I didn't consider my own body, even dead, in the deadness of Sarah's womb. But I believed in God. They said, well, I thought you said 25 years ago you're going to have the baby. I did say it 25 years ago. But Mr. Impatient there said, what, 25 years has left? Look at you now, the whiskers way down to your knees almost. Look, you're an old man. I let him know that God didn't tell me when I was going to have this baby. He said, you'll have it by Sarah, and that settled it. Amen. I held steady. Now, the word never said when, it said it would. Let's call her another witness right quick. We ain't got much time. We can call hundreds of them. Let's call her another witness yet. Moses. I have him to testify. Why he said I was trained in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. I was a professor to who wouldn't have it. But one day on the back side of the desert after I was 80 years old, I met God. And he was in the farm of a, of a sign. And he was a burning fire back in a bush. And he, he told me that he had heard the groans of his people and he remembered his promise to deliver them. And he said, I'm sending you. And I said, who am I? I can't speak well. I, I, I'm, not, I'm, not a, I'm not a theologian. I, I can't go. He said, you'll be given two signs. One of them will be in your hand. The other will be by a stick. And if they won't hear the voice of this sign, then pour some water up on the ground. It'll turn to blood. Then that finishes it. When I took my sign that God gave me and went down before Pharaoh, Pastor Pharaoh, he tried to make my gift look kind of shady. He said, most any cheap fortune teller or Egyptian can do that. Most any cheap magic man can turn these tricks. And he got out two fellows by the name of Jambers and Jammies, and actually they impersonated everything that I've done. But that didn't stop me because the voice that sent me was a scriptural voice, and I Amen. stayed with it. Amen. It was a word of God. It was a scriptural sign and a scriptural voice. Well, I remember my promise. And the time is at hand. They hadn't had no prophets in Israel for hundreds of years, 440 years. They had no prophets in Israel. But he said, I'm sending you to be one. And he went. And he told me that for a sign, I'd come back and bring the children to this mountain. It took a long time, but I did. I stayed right true to the word. And when Jambus and those carnal impersonators that tried to mock it, yet I know no matter how much mock they could give, do you know that's to repeat again in the last days? Jesus said so. The Bible said, As Jambus and Jambus withstood Moses, so will these men in the last days. Impersonators trying to act like copy after. But he said, I stood still because I know the voice was a scriptural voice. 
Yet there was two of them, only one of him. But he went down and did what he, and he, it proved out to be true. He come right back to the mountain where God told him. Step down, Moses. Let's call another witness right quick. Joshua. Joshua said when we was nearing the land, we come up to Kadesh Barnea. And Moses, a servant of God, went and took all the, uh, one out of every tribe, one out of every denomination. And he said, let's go over and spy out the land. And we went over, two of us, brought back the evidence that the land was good. They had the evidence of it. I'm a real Pentecostal. So they come back with the evidence that the land was good. But when it come to taking the full land, they said, we can't do it. We can't do it. We're not able. And the people was all tore up. They didn't know what to do, which organization to go to. And I still them. Said, remember, it's a promise of God. God said, I have given you this land. And what God promises, he'll do. I got the people quiet. The next day, you say, are we going to leave? The next day, we're going to leave. It was 40 years later, but we took the land. One more witness right quick. May I call Isaiah to stand? Isaiah, would you testify for the defense witness? Against the defen- uh, for the defendants? The defendant? I will. I was a prophet. I was a vindicated prophet. What I said, it wasn't, I didn't know what I was saying, but God made what I said come to pass. Everybody began to believe it. All the church. They began to believe it. One day a strange thing happened. The Lord God said to me, Israel's seeking signs, so I want them to do that. But I'm going to give them a super sign. And that's going to be for a super age when they have supermarkets and super jets and super, everything's super. I'm going to give them a super sign. A virgin shall conceive. And me being a vindicated prophet, every little virgin got her booties ready and everything else. She was going to have a baby. Yes, sir. She was the one Jehovah called. All kinds of things went on. Yes, sir. Well, now, we're expecting her and my daughter to, to conceive this and so of this. And every girl was looking for it. Years passed. Some of them scratched their heads and said, that old false prophet. But it was 800 years later. He didn't say when she would conceive. He said she would conceive. Amen. 800 years later, a virgin conceived. Amen. Now, for the last witness, if you'll pardon me. Can I be the last witness? That ain't back in the Bible. That's now. Let me be the next witness just for a few minutes before we start the prayer line. Listen closely. I'd like to give a testimony for him. I'd like to be called to stand and raise my hand to tell the truth. Nothing but the truth. I'd like to say, how did I ever become a Christian? My father and mother, grandfather, grandmother on both sides was all sinners. My nature was a cucklebur, and I'm not going to be a grain of wheat. <laughs> but one morning, in a little log cabin down in Kentucky, so said my mother and the midwife. On April 6th, 5 o'clock in the morning, 1909, when the Lord God brought me into the earth, there was a light standing at the little window. And when they opened the window back, mother laying on a little shuck bed to find out what kind of a baby she had. A light come whirling in. Amen. And the people of the mountains didn't know what to think about it. I was too little to know this. And as a child, about eight years old, seven or eight years old, I was packing water to a moonshine still that my father owned. While one warm September afternoon, sitting down crying, going fishing out to the pond with the boys, and they couldn't go on account of, I had to pack this water. I heard like a whirlwind in the tree about halfway up, still everywhere else, September in Indiana. Everything's real still, dying, quiet. And this whirlwind in a bush, there come a voice out of there and said, never smoke, drink, defile your body that's run with women, anything like that, for there's a work for you to do when you get older. My mother called the doctor. She thought I was so nervous. A week after that, I seen the municipal bridge in a trance. As I called it, seen the Miss Bridge cross the Ohio River and seen 16 men lose their life on it. 22 years from that day, the Miss Bridge crossed at the same place and 16 men lost their life in it. 
at Green's Mill one night, not knowing what this all was about. Later, I become a minister to serve the Lord. At Green's Mill one night, my pastors had just told me, I'd tell them about going, having a, being able to see things, and they told me it was the devil. Me being a Christian, I didn't want nothing to do with the devil. Not at all. So I went up there and said, Lord, I can't let, go through life like this. And I sat up there at a little place way back at a fishing camp praying. One night there, as Lord had spoke to me as, at a tree like he did to Moses, then here on this greens mill, there come a man in and told me that not to try to ask him, get rid of this, but it was a gift sent from God that was to be taken to the peoples of the world. And it let me know by the scriptures that all these things that have been promised according to the Bible must be fulfilled. And the time was at hand. And I went back and told my pastor. I went down and told him. And he said, Billy, what have you eat? Did you have a dream? Was that a nightmare? But to me, it was Malachi 4. Amen. He said, how are you going to do it? It was Luke 17, 30. It was also Revelation 10. It was also all these scriptures that's been promised for the last days. I didn't see it done right then. People wondered, when's this going to happen? But I just held on one day at the river. I was baptizing 500 people at the river. When all of a sudden, the same light that come in when I was a little boy, and I told the people I'd been seeing it, they said I was dreaming. It was some kind of a mental conception that I had. But before, better than 5,000 people at 2 o'clock in the afternoon in 1933, out of the skies come this cloud coming down, speaking these words as John the Baptist was commissioned to forerun the first coming of Christ, your ministry will forerun the second coming of Christ. Where thousands times thousands of people heard it, and the Amen. newspapers give witness of it. I want to say, and I want to call this to the attention of that blind prosecutor. It's looking around for some man to have thorn prints and nails and everything like that. It doesn't say that. It doesn't give such a promise. We read here in Luke the 17th chapter in the 30th verse, Jesus speaking as it was in the days of Sodom, so shall it be when the Son of Man will be revealed. When he's being revealed. I want to draw your attention to this just for a few minutes. If you'll bear with me just a few minutes longer now. Be real reverent for just a few minutes. Notice Jesus packed three names. Son of Man. Son of David, Son of God. He had three names, all the same person, but with three names. It's like Father, Son, Holy Ghost, all the same God. Three attributes. Just like me. My wife calls me husband. My children has nothing to do with me but the name of husband. I am their daddy. My little grandson sitting over there has nothing to do with me in the name of daddy, nothing in the name of husband. He is my grandchild. And it's all the same person. And we notice when Jesus come and tried to reveal himself as son of man. Don't miss this. When he revealed himself and called himself constantly the son of man. Israel was blinded. They know nothing about what son of man meant. But they said son of David. When blind Barnabas went out and recognized him, David meant king. Remember, son of man, son of David, son of God, which was Lord. This Jew got what he asked for because he approached him in the name of the son of David, the king. He wasn't savior, but he was king. But when the Greek woman, the Seraphiopian, approached him in the name of son of David, he never even as much as raised his head. She had no claims on him in the name of son of David. He was the son of David to that Seraphiopian woman. But when she said, Lord, then he turned around. He was the Lord. Amen. Lord, he was Lord, no son of David to her. Now, why wasn't he recognized as son of man? The son of man was the spiritual revelation of prophet. Son of man means prophet. Now, if you'll turn over in your Bibles to Ezekiel, the second chapter and the first verse, you'll find out. That Ezekiel was the prophet, the word of God for that day. And Jehovah himself called him the son of man. Amen. Jehovah 
calling a man the Son of Man is saying that Jesus revealed himself as Son of Man. What was it? The promised word of that hour being made manifest. Same God. God of Ezekiel's time. God of Jesus' time. Son of Man. He was not at that time. He was the Son of Man because he has come to reveal himself to Israel as a prophet. And they rejected it. And that was the prophecy that they should receive him in. In the name of the Son of Man. A prophet because it was according to the word. Deuteronomy 18, 15. The Lord your God shall raise up a prophet like unto me. And when he come, he identified himself in his ministry as a man. Not a son of God, son of man. God is a spirit. And he revealed himself as son of man. What he claimed to be. And they was blinded and couldn't see it. But now, unto the Gentiles, he reveals himself, and now the Son of God, which is the Holy Ghost. Now, Jesus said, as it was in the days of Sodom, I want this blind prosecutor to see this. He's a blind interpreter of the Word always. He takes his organizational ideas of it and knows no more about it than nothing. He does it to deceive because he is a deceiver at the beginning. Jesus said, as it was in the days of Sodom, when the Son of Man is being revealed, in the days of Sodom was the Son, was God revealed in human flesh, which is one time called Melchizedek, the father. Melchizedek at that time had no father, no mother, no beginning of days or no ending of life. Ever who he was, he remains the same. Jesus had father and mother. But this man had neither father nor mother. And he appeared to Abraham in the form of a son of man. Elohim. Jehovah. The church now has served the term through the church age in the baptism of the Holy Ghost. But Jesus said here to make Malachi 4 and the rest of these scriptures real to you. See? That in the last days, just before the coming, the world setting will be like the Sodom. And the Son of Man will reveal Himself as the Son of Man, like He did in the days of Sodom. Blind prosecutor, can't you see that? His words are true, not nail scars and prints and thorns. It's the Son of God impersonated in His church as Son of Man. It has to fulfill Malachi 4 and the rest of the Scriptures. I call to the court's attention. Look at that real good. Son of man. Like God. The Father. God. The Son. God. The Holy Ghost. It's the same God. Three different attributes of the same God. Now, this is Son of David. Son of man revealed then as a prophet. Son of David, the king. And now the Son of God to the church age, as God isn't man, God is a spirit. And the spirit, Son, is the Holy Ghost, which is revealing the church age. But promise you in the last days that the Son of Man would be revealed. Blind prosecutor, do you get that? I want you to know, blind prosecutor, we see it. We believe it. These words fulfill before us. And we know that they're the truth. To the Jews, he was the son of David. To the Greeks, he was Lord. To us, he's Lord. To the Gentiles. And now, in the last days, he would return back again as son of man. Because Malachi promises that there would be a prophet rise up in the last days that would return the hearts of the people back to, away from them organizations, back to the original word, the faith of the fathers, the original Pentecost. And when he did it, St. John 14, 12, the works that he did would be done also. Revelations 10 promised the whole mystery. How are you going to reveal the mystery? See what Luther left off. See what Wesley left off. See what Pentecost left off. And then reveal the secret of the heart to make it the same God through every age. 
which is nothing but God's word being made manifest back to Son of Man again. We don't look for nail scars. We look for the word made manifest. Notice, God promised these things. Now, and he does it just as he said. I could say more, but we'll leave this subject. It's getting late. Mr. Prosecutor, I want you to know that I can call a thousand witnesses here this afternoon. I want you to know that the things that he said that he did, we are witnesses. That he keeps his word. There is a genuine Holy Ghost meeting. Amen. There is a genuine power of God. And there is a genuine promise that they shall recover when they lay hands on the sick. I want you to know that. I want you to know he said, as it was in the days of Sodom, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. I am a stranger. And I'm only bearing record of what the Bible says to be truth. If you notice, the angel of the Lord that come in the form of a man had his back turned to the tent. And he told... Abraham, what Sarah was thinking. Jesus said it would repeat. Now, if I have told the truth, let God confirm that to be the truth. Let him reveal it. Then it's no secret. We know then. I'll leave this court this afternoon with this verdict to make in your own mind. Let the God that made the promise not back in them days. They were vindicated. Let the God that make the promise vindicate it today. Say the same. Some of you think in your heart. Pray to God for your sickness or your affliction. And see if God will reveal the secret of the heart. I challenge you to do it from one side to the other. How would I dare to do a thing like that? If I wasn't standing exactly on what the scripture said. I want this court to see that he's the same yesterday, today, forever. He keeps his promise. And he promised that Jesus Christ would be revealed in the last days as a son of man. A man sitting here suffering with hemorrhoids. I've never seen you in my life. If that's right, raise up your hand. You believe me to give witness of the word of God? That's your wife sitting next to you. She's suffering also. Cyst on her head. If that's right, raise up your hand. You believe God can tell me who you are? If he's still the word, the word knows the secret of the heart. You are a Mr. and Mrs. Hunt. If that's right, raise up your hand. Why don't you believe it? Here. Here sits a man sitting right here. His head down, crying, praying. For himself and also for his wife. She isn't here. She's not with you this afternoon. She's suffering. You believe God can tell me what her trouble is? And her not here? You believe it? You do. I'm a stranger to you. Is that right? Your wife has a female trouble. If that's right, raise up her hand high. So they sit. And your name is Mr. Smith. Do you believe that God will make her well? If that's right, wave your hand up and down like this. I challenge you to believe that Jesus Christ is revealed in the form of Son of Man. And you will believe that God's body is set in the form. Here's a woman sitting there looking at her. She suffers with high blood pressure. You believe that God can tell me who you are? They call you Daisy. Is that right? Raise up your hand. Believe now with all your heart, Jesus Christ will make you give you your desire. You see, He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. You believe it? Amen. Here's a man sitting right back here looking at him. He's got a burden on his heart. It's for his son. His son has diabetes. You believe? That was your wife that started weeping right next to you there. She's got a burden on her heart. That's for her sister. 
Her sister has heart trouble, complications. You're Mr. and Mrs. Sickles. Is that right? Wave your hand up and down like this. If I'm a total stranger to you, stand up on your feet. Stand up if I'm a stranger to you and don't know you. What is it? Amen. The full of the Word of God in the last days, prosecutor. I want you to know that the Word of God is true. God told me that 33 years ago. I've waited all this time, but it's fulfilled right here this afternoon. God keeps His Word. He's Amen. the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. God bless you. Go and get your desire now. Your mind is the jury. The jury has to make up its mind. And the way you act from now on will pronounce or show to the people what your verdict is. Yes. Is he guilty or is he not guilty? Amen. Do you believe that he's not guilty? That he does keep his word. It's us that has it. We're listening to old man impatient, Mr. Unbeliever and Mr. Skeptic. But now, you believe that God keeps his word? Your mind is a jury. And the way you act from hereafter will prove to the people what your verdict is. Amen. Amen. Let us bow our heads there. I've told you the honest truth. <coughs> if we had time to stay here, there ain't a scripture in the Bible what will testify to the same thing. I've been honest. You know, sometimes to be honest, it's not an easy path. But as long as God stands there, it wasn't easy for Luther, Wesley, or none of the rest. It isn't easy for you or anybody else that takes a stand. But this afternoon, you've got to make your stand. He never said, he said, they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. If you believe it, then I don't care if it happens right here, if it happens next week, if it happens 20 years today. If you absolutely believe it, it's got to happen. Amen. There's a doctor sitting present now, as I understand. I want to thank him. I was at a patient, a deceased patient a while ago or early this morning in a hospital who's bound to die. I saw the thing. She's so eaten with cancer. And this little woman said to me, he said, my surgeon has been tanning your meeting and he agrees with you. And not only that, but Brother Branham, I want you to know he's standing with you in prayer for me. If I need any medical attention, I'd want him to give it to me. A man that can trust God like that. Yes, they're in all walks of life and all professions. Let's remember, the verdict is yours now. Lord Jesus, I've just tried to explain the word. You've testified that it's the truth. Your witnesses, we could have called hundreds. And yet we have at the time. Here also lays handkerchiefs laying here that's going to the sick and the afflicted. Right here where the Holy Spirit gives witness that Jesus is still alive. We are knowing by his life. The life that he lived, the things that he did. We pray God now is laying hands upon these handkerchiefs. That whosoever they touch, may they be healed. I offer my prayer with faith along with this other bunch of believers for these who are not able to be here. May they enjoy the greatness of God. They may be sick and can't come. Some poor old father sitting back there in a the room pecking on a little white cane this afternoon waiting for this handkerchief to return. That baby laying around the hospital burning up with a fever and someone waiting to bring it the handkerchief. Let the power of Almighty God go with them. Anoint them as the same anointing has been up on the meeting this afternoon, and may they recover, Lord. We offer this prayer in their behalf because they wasn't present. But you're omnipresent. May you be there to confirm your word. Through Jesus Christ's name. Now let the Holy Spirit truly, not emotion, not some kind of just a halfway hope, but a genuine verdict may be passed by this, what I call this afternoon, the court. May each one of them give testimony the same as they take their prayer card and hold in their hands as they cross the platform. May when they have been ministered to according to the 16th chapter of St. Mark, they shall lay their hands upon the sick and they shall recover. As your elected servants stand here and we lay our hands upon them, Lord, may it settle it forever. May they go out of here just as happy and forget about they ever had any troubles. Because they're sure like Abraham was, that God is able to 
perform the promises that he made. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. I love you. I love you. Because he first loved me. And first loved salvation on Calvary's tree. How many has got your verdict? Raise your hands. I've got my verdict. All right, court. You will be ministered to according to God's holy word. These signs shall follow them that believe. I'm not going to leave you sitting here thinking that just because this gift, that, that makes anybody any more than anybody else. You've got godly pastors here. They're here. I'm going to ask them to stand with me on the platform. They'll lay their hands on the same as I do. They had us to come here. And they're here as your as witnesses of God. They're bearing witnesses to the truth. Now, I can't say Brother Branham laid hands because my hands is no more than theirs or anybody else's. It's your faith, your verdict that you pass on the Word of God. God keep, And if God can keep that part of the Word and prove it to you, then you're already healed because by His stripes you were healed. Now, I want all that's in this section over here that's got prayer cards, stand up on that side around the wall. Now, all that's in this section here that has prayer cards, stand up in the middle of the aisle and face back that way. And all that's in this section here that has prayer cards. Now, on this, this section here, I turn back the other way. Now, go back this way. Turn the other way. It goes on a straight line. All that's in this section, come out this way. Face back that way. And all that's in this section up here that's got prayer cards, come out this way and face back that way. And the prayer line will be run. All that's in the balcony with prayer cards, wants to be prayed for, come right down and fall right in behind this next section as they come. While they're coming, I'll... Can we call other ministers? Is it all right to give it to witness? Is all, is all right to you all? What's your verdict in the trial? I know. <laughs> all right. The pastors wants to know, wants to fellowship with other ministers. They want any minister in here that believes in God and believes in laying hands on the sick. And their verdict is the afternoon that it's the truth. They invite you as their colleagues to come here and stand on the platform with us while we pray. All pastors that's filled with God's spirit and your verdict now is that you believe that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You believe that Mark 16 is the truth. These pastors here wants to invite you up here now as their colleagues to the gospel. Come up here and stand on the platform with us as we form these prayer lines to pray. Right here, bring up this way. All pastors in the building, no matter what denomination, they just told me to ask you, come on up here if you wish to come at this time and form this prayer line to be praying. Pray for the sick, lay hands on the sick. How many in here that isn't as well now? Huh? And you don't have to be prayed for, but you are believers. Raise up your hands. Will you promise me also that your prayers will be going up with we pastors while we're praying for these people? What if that was your mother standing over there? What if that was your wife? What if that was your brother or sister? Remember, it's somebody's mother. It's somebody's brother. It's somebody's sister. It's some mother's boy or girl. It's somebody's. And we will do to others as we have others do to us. Now, I want you, everyone, to be reverent in prayer. And while they've got their lines formed about now to where they can come through, I want the ministers now to come here and form a double line right around the side of the platform here. Right up and down this way, form a double line. So if the people passing by, I'll set this microphone back. Mr. Borders will be standing here leading in song. Right up, double line up and down this way. So the people. Now, that each one of you is standing in line. To make a double sure to Satan, the prosecutor, that your decision is made up, your very sense, that you believe that Mark 16 is God's word and it's the truth, and you're coming through this line to have hands laid upon you, and from this time on, your action is going to prove what your verdict was. Raise up your hands and say, I promise about that. All of them have a line. 
Now let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, the, this people this afternoon, as we have used it like a court, I feel, Lord, you've had a, a real trial. Pilate didn't give you the right time. He got false witnesses. But you have heard of the false witness, the, the defense witness, the Holy Spirit, come to confirm the word before the people. You've had a fair trial. And the people have made up their mind and passed their verdict, they say. And they're coming through to prove to the world that they believe your word is so. It's been misinterpreted. Some of them say, let me see you do this, let me see you do that. It ain't according to the word. The word said they shall recover. And we brought witnesses to the platform to prove it. That's what she said. You do things your own way. Now, I pray, Father, that you will grant these blessings this afternoon to the people. As your servant, and with all your other servants, hundreds of them here, we offer our prayer for these people. Anoint these fine pastors, Lord. And if skeptic ever comes by, or if unbeliever, or Mr. Impatient, or any of those critics, scoffers that's been through every age, if they come by these people, made in this court this afternoon, rain out against it, their testimony, to know as it was in the days of Noah, as it was in the days of Sodom, both in destructions, how they scoffed and made fun, but it didn't make any difference. The believers held back to the word, and we're ready to hold to the word this afternoon, Father. I join myself with your other pastors here to lay hands upon these people. May the power of Almighty God, which we know is present now, vindicate the word, make each one of them well. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Brother Roy, if you'll come to the platform. Every head bow now, everybody praying and singing. If you don't pray, sing. Only believe. As you pass through, just when you pass through, just no matter what you say or do, that's up to you. If you want to shout, shout, if you want to walk off, no matter what it is, just believe God. Walk off and say, it's seven in our heart. Just like if you went to the pool to be baptized. That settles it if you believe it. Amen. You'll be a Christian as long as you believe. Is that right? Amen. You'll be healed as long as you believe. That's all great. All together, let's sing now.
appreciate you.